Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, man, thank you for joining us today here on the webinar. So hopefully everybody can see my uh, screen okay and hear me fine. If uh, you have any problems seeing or hearing anything, please let us know uh, using a new headset for the first time. So hopefully it all works out well. So uh, so what we want to cover today is really about going into uh, to projection and selling projection uh, versus, you know, maybe a flat panel or some other applications, uh, you know, because unfortunately a lot of our clients are kind of getting watered down a little bit they look at a big screen as being a 65 75 even an 85 inch screen and you know unfortunately so many people are kind of getting that well it's good enough it's big enough uh uh you know syndrome uh you know even going up to a 100 inch panel 100 inch z9 uh that we had out for the past couple of years or new 98 uh inch uh, z9g that's uh that's coming out here uh here later this year again very large screens but they're not really a truly a cinematic experience so we want to really get customers you know understand you know why we want to go big why we need something that big because yeah, yes we we do need something that big of course we do uh you know looking at you know what's the advantage of sony versus all these other guys uh you know when we start looking at projectors there's a massive massive range of projection technology uh you know price points from a thousand dollars to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars what is the sony advantage what are our technologies that we're using to really create this incredible picture of this uh, this great experience and then a product overview of the lineup so you can help uh, help gauge what product is right for your client uh, what's the right application what's the right product so uh, without any further ado let's start about sell talk about selling uh, front projection uh, you know again as we mentioned you know a lot of clients look at projection or a, as a screen you know 75 inch or bigger as big enough and a lot of people honestly have had some bad experiences with projection so when we talk about selling an experience over 75 inches we will look at that viewing distance uh socially viewing you know what's what's that well, you know social viewing having your friends over watching the game experiencing that large uh, large immersive image and then also having family friendly viewing you know what's what's it like with the lights on what are our everyday living applications uh so we want to look at all of those things and experience and when we start talking with a client about about these uh, these type of things, we can start to determine, hey, where are you going to be sitting in the room? What size is really going to be right for you? And you want to do this all really without talking about, you know, necessarily the technology that's behind it. Let's look at what size is right because so many people have had you know, maybe some less than favorable experiences with projection. The first rule of selling projectors is don't talk about the projector. Again, let's focus on all of those other things. Ask the client, hey, where are you going to sit when you go to a movie theater? It's a completely open theater. Where do you want to sit? How far back is your seating in your room? Are we doing multiple rows of seating? You know, kind of what's that application? And so let's get them on that experience and screen size. And again, not talk so much about the projector because, you know, when we do get to start talking about projectors a little bit, you know, let's ask somebody, you know, hey, what is a good projection experience you've had? You know, most people, if you ask them, hey, where have you seen a really great projector? They're going to tell you something like this. Hey, in the theater. But they also have the mindset that the theater can be very expensive. And, you know, that what? They're, they're correct. Uh, these theaters are using Sony projectors that run anywhere from around 125,000 up through well over half a million. You bet it's expensive, but that is a true native theater experience. And then I like to ask a client, hey, what's a bad projection experience you've, you've had? And think about yourselves. I mean, where have you been and seen a bad projector? How about the boardroom? How about that conference room? How about someplace like this? You know, where they're using the cheapest projector with, hey, the best spec, the best light output. And, you know, really, quite honestly, it creates a, a pretty awful viewing environment uh, when you're using a data grade projector and you're trying to watch TV on it. Uh, you've got a, a really bad projector experience that that most people are used to uh, to seeing. So let's look at how we can turn this around and into a really positive experience. Uh, again, looking at that viewing distance, uh, social and family viewing, that 55 inch screen. You know, again, honestly, it's just not big. That's maybe a bedroom TV. Uh, you know, 55, 65s are, are really the next size. That's really becoming the most popular bedroom. Uh, 75 
85 is great for a living room. But when we talk about that big screen experience, nothing beats 120 inches or bigger type, uh, type screen experience. Uh, so how do we figure out how big a client should be putting into their home? You know, so we want to look at that and how it compares to the cinema environment. Uh, now, I say don't talk about projectors, don't talk about the technology. Here I am going to dig a little bit into the technology just so you have a background and understand what this means, is we want to compare this to a, a home environment, that professional cinema versus the, the home cinema. When we look at a professional cinema, Everywhere you go, they are all designed around a basic principle of, of uh, one picture height to three picture height. You go into a, a, a uh, your local AMC or Cinemark or whatever your favorite flavor of cinema is, that front row is designed to be at one times picture height. The back row is designed to be at three times picture height. The magic seat is kind of what I call it right here where that walkway is when you come into the theater. That is designed to be at one and a half times picture height. And so that one and a half to three times picture height is very important when you ask a client, where do you want to sit? Hey, somebody says, you know what, I sit you know, a little more towards the back. You're going to want to design a theater for them that's maybe at two and a, two, two and a half times screen height. You've got somebody like myself, I like to sit right on that front row. Again, not the very front, but that front row where the railing is. One, I want to be able to, I don't want anybody in front of me. But two, I also know that that, that seat is at one and a half times the picture height of the uh, uh, you know viewing distance ratio. So that is going to give me the closest experience to allow me to really fully be immersed in that image. How do we, where did all these numbers come from? It's looking at, oh geez, that thing in school that we had used to have to do, uh, good old math, and looking at visual acuity. Again, you can bore customer to tears talking about, you know, the consensus for standard good vision is the Snell infraction of 2020. But everybody's probably heard all about that. But, uh, you know, starts talking about one degree is equal to 60 subdivisions or arc minutes, and the strokes and the voids that fill these letters on the, uh, the vision chart are one arc minute thick. So, you know, you can start going through all of this, and it comes down to the viewers with 2020 vision can discern 60 digital pixels per degree. So what does all that mean? The math for calculating picture height. And if we look pixels per, per degree times vertical viewing angle equals vertical pixels uh, you know, produced uh, for, the, uh, for the image. So this is a ultimate math comes down to optimal distance for 1080p is higher than three times your picture height. Optimal distance for 4K is at one and a half times picture height. One and a half times picture height is that front row where the railing is in the theater. So what, again, what does all this math mean? You can so tell your client this a whole lot easier without getting into all these nitty gritty, nitty -gritty, uh, nitty -gritty details by saying, hey, you can sit closer to a 4K and enjoy a larger, clear picture. It's pretty simple that way. One and a half times picture height. Full HD, we want to be at three times picture height. So you can now determine that exact experience of what works well for that client. So bigger, closer, clear with a 4K image. Uh, so, you know, now what's our advantage? Uh, 4K, we were able to hang our hats on it for a long time that we were the only manufacturer with native 4K pro uh, projection. And then some of these other guys started coming along. Uh, and there are actually other native 4K products now out there, um, you know, soon to be shipping here at a uh, price range that's somewhat similar to, uh, to ours. But again, no matter what anybody has out there, nobody has that professional display experience that we do. And if you've been to one of my TV trainings or anything before, you know, uh, you've heard this story time and time again. Uh, Sony, the lens to living room approach that we have is unlike anything else that's out there. We know how to do it right because we make the movies. We make the content. We make the cameras. We make the professional equipment. We make the, uh, the editing consoles. We do absolutely every single part of that video production experience. We are the content experts. Uh, you know, I get goosebumps when I go to a movie and I see that Sony logo pop up there on the screen, uh, knowing that this came from my company, PlayStation, Game 
streaming applications, uh, you know, uh, TV broadcasts. You know, when you watch, uh, you know, an NFL game. Uh, if anybody watched the uh, the Saints got get screwed over here this past weekend. That replay was show, was filmed on a Sony 4K camera. Uh, the uh, editing booths, they have Sony 4K monitors. It's really only a matter of time until they're doing 4K broadcasts uh, of even NFL games. But, you know, they're already shooting them, so let's just get the, uh, the broadcast is uh, coming along here pretty quickly. Uh, we look at our technologies like our reality crush. And again, TV uh, technologies match in very similar to projection technologies. We want to make sure that we clean up and we give you the best possible image out of every single pixel. Uh, our X1 processor that's in our televisions is in our projectors. We can use this, uh, leverage this technology to look at that signal, clean it up, make sure that you get the best possible viewing experience smooth motion, fast detail. Uh, we can do, the, again, this, again, better than anybody else, you, leveraging our motion flow technology. Uh, and this is new for our projectors this year. This year, every single one of our projectors has 4K motion flow capability. Uh, so you're not going to have to worry about any any dragging in images, any input lag, any uh, soap opera effect. We do very natural, very smooth and detailed uh, motion processing on every single one of our projectors. Uh, our triluminous display, that wide color space, uh, wide color space was very important with SDR. It is even more important now that we have HDR content, that we have this really wide color range, creating billions of colors on the image on the screen simultaneously here. Uh, 10 and 12 bit color depth, being able to do this fine, fine color detail. And then again, being able to do true native 4K projection. And also understanding that for, that HD is not necessarily dead. There is definitely an application for HD. So when it comes to making a 4K projector, we produce the world's best 4K uh, imagers, the world's best 4K technology, leveraging our you know nearly 15 years experience in this uh, in this realm. When it comes to HD projectors, we don't try and do some of this uh, you know simulated up conversion, down conversion, you know deal, double flashing, all this other stuff that's out there. We want to simply produce the best HD image that's available. So how do we do that? Again, true 4K. Uh, you know, every one of our projectors is 4096 by 2160. That's all 8 million pixels all the time in all full color range. Uh, when you look at the other guys that are out there, they were doing some of this 4K enhanced, 4K e-shift, 4K DLP double flashy. I don't care what they call it. If they are not using all 8 million pixels with all the color all at the same time, it's not native 4K. Uh, there's only one other manufacturer out there that's producing a native 4K, uh, that other Japanese company. They've got a $35,000 unit out now, and uh, they're going to have some other units coming out here sooner than later. Uh, apparently, they've been delayed. but And again, very good uh, equipment, but they're a very first generation of a native 4K. When you look at our native 4K projectors, you're looking at, over, again, over 15 years of experience of building 4K projection technology. Uh, so uh, when you talk about that true theater experience, you know, you go to a professional cinema, you're watching a movie on a Sony 4K digital cinema projector. We can deliver that exact same 4K digital cinema experience into the home, but into that right size and scope of application. Uh, we're also going to work with all of your 4K content. We are going to work with all of your 4K HDR movies. Those are filmed at 24 hertz, 10-bit uh, color depth, really easy for a projector to do. There is one movie called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, probably one of the worst movies ever made, but it, visually it is one of the most stunning movies ever made. Why? Because Ang Lee shot it at 4K, uh, actually shot at 4K 120 hertz, but Nothing could, it was actually capable of playing that back, but 4K 60 hertz was the release on it of Blu-ray. 4K 60 hertz, 10 bit. Hey, we work beautifully with all of that content. HDR streaming, oh, gosh, so much 4K HDR streaming out there uh, across uh, multiple platforms. We work with it all. 4K HDR gaming, boy, this is a big one. Uh, PlayStation 4 Pros, Xbox One X, uh, Xbox don't don't use the Xbox One S. Please have your client get the X, uh, Xbox One X, much much better machine. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, a lot of devices cannot really do true 4K 
HDR gaming. They either have to downdress, they've got band color banding, they've got high input lag. Uh, that big E brand out there cannot do 4K HDR gaming. Uh, we will absolutely do all of your 4K HDR gaming with with virtually no input lag, super fast gaming performance on our projectors. And then of course those HDR broadcast, uh, you know, direct TV, uh, you know, pretty fair amount of HDR programming right now, uh, live basketball, uh, uh, NBA, college sports, uh, man, it's only a matter of time until we get considerably more uh, HDR broadcasts coming along. So uh, we work with all of that content. You know, again, some of our reality uh, technologies that we're doing, this is one of those kind of often at times overlooked aspects of a projector is what kind of panel technology is it using? SXRD is a Sony proprietary panel technology. It's our silicon crystal reflective device. And again, it's a technology that we've been working with uh, in a 4K realm for over 15 years. Uh, it overall, geez, 20, 25 years almost of working with this SXRD technology. So it's a very solid, very proven technology, but we're not content to just sit back and, and you know, hang with it as is. We're constantly working on improving it. Uh, so in our most recent evolution, our advanced SXRD panels uh, have eliminated those little contact divots, eliminated the beveled edges, and given you the, the tightest control of the light as it's reflected off these chipsets. Each projector has three of these SXRD panels, one for red, one for green, one for blue. So you get that very wide uh, color space, very high reflectivity, and of course, extremely high contrast as well. Uh, when we look at this at how it compares to some of these other technologies, uh, such as an LCD, uh, LCD is very common out there for projectors that are extremely bright. Uh, SXRD can, is a transmissive uh, or I'm sorry, SXRD is a reflective display where LCD is a transmissive. So the light is passing through the pixels instead of an SXRD where we're reflecting light off the pixels. Couple of big advantages of SXRD is one, because it is a micro mirror device, we have an, ex these pixels can go extremely close together. Uh, 0.2 microns uh, distance between the pixels. That gives us a 93% fill factor. An LCD technology is a relatively low pixel fill factor. They only fill 60 to 70 percent of the uh, of the panel. And so what that means is when you get a SXRD Sony 4K projector or even a 1080p projector, you're getting absolutely minimal light loss. All of that light that you're paying for is returned to the screen. When you look at a LCD based projector, they run into some pretty significant light loss issues. Uh, they're, they're losing 30 to 40 percent of their light output because the light that goes in between those individual pixels is light that's gone. It's lost you're never getting it back. Just like if you use a, a, an acoustically transparent screen, it's got holes in it. The light that goes through those holes is gone. That is not returning to your viewer. Uh, so we are going to give you the most light off of our projectors. And, you know, I say the proof is in the uh, the performance. Look at our projectors, you'll see. But also, you know, for that customer who really got, has to see that spec and well, that, that e-brand projector was 2,400 lumens. You're trying to sell me a 1,500 lumen projector. Why should I do that? Well, if you look at our performance, and this is on our 285. Unfortunately, our 295 hasn't had the detailed reviews come out like this. But our 295, two, excuse me, 285 projector, uh, which is rated at 1,500 lumens, uh, Art Fireman at projectorreviews.com does a great job of breaking down those real-world numbers. In our Cinema Film 1, which is our out-of-the-box, most accurate calibrated mode was 1561 lumens. We actually outperformed spec. When we look at the uh, the other guys that are out there, uh, again, Art did his same measurements here on the uh, eBrand 6040 uh, in their cinema mode. Uh, they came out with uh, a considerably lower brightness at only 501 lumens of output. Even at its brightest mode, um, you know, at uh, uh, dynamic, uh, they were only getting 1,652. If they really, really pushed it, they got 2,387, not even hitting really the full projector spec, full brightness that, uh, that they claim on their spec sheets. But uh, our 285 and now the 295 will absolutely do this with its native 
uh, high contrast brightness. So we also, again, look at these Sony technologies and understanding how we can get the most out of it with our HDR. Uh, when we look at uh, you know, how movies are made, uh, virtually every movie that you watch is, has been mastered on a Sony monitor. Vast majority of TV shows that you've watched have been mastered on Sony monitors. And when it comes to theater performance, our BVMX 300 is that reference grade monitor for HDR grading. Uh, it's an Academy Award winning monitor, uh, won the Academy Award for science and technology and filmmaking. That is how perfect this, uh, this OLED monitor is. Of course, it's an OLED monitor. It's only 30 inches. It's, uh, uh, it's gone up in price now to about $40,000. Uh, so it's not really a reasonable monitor for anybody to buy for their home. Uh, but it is the reference point that everything is judged by. It is perfect color, perfect brightness from zero to a thousand nits. So uh, it really can tell us exactly what our video content is doing. Unfortunately, uh, home cinemas, commercial cinemas cannot get to a thousand nits brightness. They are a much lower brightness than a, uh, than a reference grade monitor like that BVMX 300. Commercial cinema, Simpty Spec, uh, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, says a commercial cinema should be at 14 foot Lamberts. It's about 50 nits of brightness. Home cinema, we're getting up to about 150 nits brightness on a uh, on a average system there. So really, we can get much brighter with home cinema, but we're still not able to get to that thousand nit level. So what we have to do with this HDR content is we have to do tone mapping. We have to take that thousand nit image and squeeze it down to the 100, 150 nit range of what our projectors are capable of doing. And this is where we map tone map very accurately to follow that projector curve to give you the most accurate tone mapping that's available. Uh, so what this means is you're going to give with a Sony HDR projector, it's going to be lower brightness in the flat panel, but you're going to have higher contrast. You're going to have brighter highlights, more color depth, uh, more shadow detail, less color banding. You're going to get a more immersive, more depth of your image with a Sony HDR projector. Uh, and when we actually compare this in real world scenes versus some of the other guys, they try to get you that super high brightness. Uh, but ultimately what happens is it blows out color, it blows out detail. These are actual screenshots of competitive uh, projectors here, uh, competitors HDR projector where they just tried to go bright but they blew out all of the color and all of the depth of those flames. Uh, here's another screenshot with a, uh, you know, one of the, our favorite demos here, Oblivion. Uh, yeah, and I, I kind of hate that we play this one so much, but it's just got so many good scenes in it. Uh, you see here with proper tone mapping, there's three individual lights visible. Uh, with the competitor's DLP projector, they don't know how to tone map that properly, so it just gets a big bloom of light. You're not actually getting any detail in those lights on the right side of the screen or on the left. You can see actual the three individual lights as was meant to be seen. Uh, so again, these are real world examples of proper tone mapping with, uh, with real projected images. So Sony projectors are going to be able to do all of this best detail, best content for you. We're also going to be able to leverage our technologies to give you the best possible performance. Uh, Dynamic Iris is a big part of our projector lineup in both our 1080p and 4K projectors. A Dynamic Iris, most of you are probably familiar with local dimming for flat panel, where I can turn off and on individual segments of the LEDs to get better black levels, higher brightness. Unfortunately, projection, we can't do this. We have to use a, an iris uh, to control that light output. So the light output being controlled by the iris for very bright scenes, it can open up. For dark scenes, it can close down. So we're going to give you, you know, the best possible black level, the best possible contrast on a frame by frame, scene by scene basis. So again, here a very bright scene, that iris is going to open up. When the skin gets darker, it closes down. So we really do give you that, that best possible dynamic range and contrast capability. We also uh, give you a picture position memory in many of our projectors. And, you know, for us, I think, you know, projection aspect ratio, is a big gray area for a lot of you guys. Uh, it is, is, 
you know, kind of, fr uh, kind of frustrating to explain this to a customer. I've talked to clients until I'm blue in the face about it and they just don't get it. But then they call and complain. Why do I have these black bars on my screen? I just bought this new TV, this new projector, whatever. Why do I have black bars? Let's take a take a quick break and look at those. Of course, native for, uh, HD and 4K aspect ratio is 16 by 9. We're used to that. That's what we've had for, for many, many years now. Uh, standard definition TV and some of your old broadcast are going to be 4 by 3, so you have those black bars on the side. But movies are made usually in a 235 uh, to 240 aspect ratio, 35 anamor millimeter anamorphic or you know digital cinema they're all going they're over 90 percent of your new releases are at a 235 to one uh, or wider aspect ratio so when you have a native 235 screen you have an hd image on it with black bars on the side but we can get rid of those black bars on the top and the bottom so why is all of that really important picture position memory allows us to move the lens back and forth to give you no black bars on the top and the bottom, maintaining constant image height. Uh, you know, think back to when we were talking about how that seating distance really affects you. When you get those black bars on the top and the bottom, when you're watching a movie, your image just got 33% smaller. And it's very easy to sell this if you just simply explained it this way to your client. Why you want picture position or an anamor or or an anamorphic lens? You know we can do do it a variety of different ways. And a two three five screen is you're watching TV. Hey, you're watching the Super Bowl. You're watch you're playing games. You're watching TV, which is all in a want uh, sixteen by nine aspect ratio. We've designed that system for that proper 16 by uh, that image height of one and a half times to three times their viewing distance to give them that proper setup. And then we go to watch a movie. And that movie just got 33% smaller. You know, Spider Man, Star Wars, whatever, should never be smaller than the news. With picture position, we can fill that screen up get rid of those black bars, and instead of having an image that's 33% smaller, now we have an image that's 80% larger. So if you want to sell a 235 screen, it's really simple. Ask your client this question. Okay, we've determined what size you want for watching TV or sports or games. Now when it comes to movies, would you like your image to be 33% smaller or 80% bigger? What do you think they're going to say? 80% bigger is a really easy sell. And now instead of doing that 235 uh, 16 by 9 screen, you do a 235 screen, use picture position, which is available on our 695 series projectors and higher. And you've raised your average selling price, you've raised uh, of your screen, you've raised your projector level, and you've sold the client a more immersive system that they're not going to see at their buddy's house either. So this is really a great way to do it. The other application is we can also use an anamorphic lens. If you ever dealt with any of the old runcos back in the day, you might be hopefully not going into a little PTSD shock here. Anamorphic lenses are a whole lot easier than what they used to be. Uh, anamorphic lenses from Panamorph and a variety of other companies are now all fixed. They don't have to move back and forth uh, to uh, to change aspect ratios. And with all of our current projectors, uh, everything from a, from a 45 ES all the way up to the 5000 ES, uh, we also we, they support anamorphic 4K lens modes in all of these projectors. So what that means is the you've got the projector. Uh, in an anamorphic mode, the projector will vertically stretch the image to fill the height of the image. And then the lens will squeeze it back out to fill the width of the screen. Couple of advantages of using an anamorphic lens. One, you get instant aspect ratio changes. We don't have to wait for the projector to move to change lens ratios. We don't have to wait, wait for, um, we also get allowed the uh, the system to fill up the entire width of the screen with all of the content. You know, some people want to watch sports in a 235 aspect ratio. I don't know why. It makes everybody just gain 20 pounds. But, hey, that's the client. That's their choice. They, if they want to do it, they can. And then the other big benefit of a 23 of an anamorphic lens is it allows you higher brightness. 
because we are using that full panel with the anamorphic lens, you get a brightness increase of a, up to about uh, 28 percent, uh, depending upon which series of optics that you use on the projector. So uh, really exceptional uh, usage with the lens. Uh, check with Panamore for your favorite lens supplier uh, for more details on this. And if you need any help designing a system, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to, uh, to help you out in designing a system. So, and again, you can, it's really great that we can also take all of our content and fill it out to 235 if you choose to do so. So looking at the product lineup. Uh, so we've got a uh, really a great lineup of projectors, the, the most full lineup in the industry, uh, starting off with 1080p projectors. Uh, our 45 ES at 1999 is a uh, full HD projector using UHP lamp with 1800 lumens of output, a 6,000 hour lifespan on that lamp. Uh, we use the uh, lamp technology and ballast technology gives us the longest lifespan of our lamps in the industry. Uh, 6,000 hours in low, uh, if you have it in the high lamp mode, you're going to expect about 4,000 hours, but again, we're considerably higher than any Anybody else in the industry. Uh, our motion flow 240 processing on this projector is really exceptional. It has a reality creation, has an anamorphic lens support for HD lenses, and it has a super low lag gaming mode. Uh, so, you know, for $2,000, that's a lot of projector. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we want to go something a step up, we want something with more brightness, uh, with a little bit more contrast capability, uh, with more control capability, we go up to our 65. Primary difference between the 45 and the 65 is the 40, 65 features our dynamic iris. That gives you about a 50% increase in peak contrast capability over the 45. It also uh, supports full IP control for your uh, control systems at $29.99. I get also a lot of people telling me, hey, Andrew, uh, why, why are we, why is Sony even selling 1080p projectors anymore? Hell, 8K is just being announced at, at, uh, at CES. Sony's coming out with 8K panels. Samsung's coming out with 8K. LG, everybody's coming out with the 8K stuff. Why in the world are we doing, still doing uh, 1080p? Well, let's look at it from a couple of different perspectives. One, it's content. There's still a ton of 1080p content, uh, that massively overwhelming amount of 1080p and below content versus 4K. Uh, some clients aren't all going to be there all the way. Uh, so you're not, uh, you know, for that 1080p content to take it through a, uh, you know, one of these quasi 4K projectors that's taking it and trying to do some simulated up conversion to 4K, you know, let's just, you know, watch it in its native 1080p format. And again, these quasi 4K projectors that take a 4K signal in and then down res it to 1080p to do its little signal processing and, and smoke and mirrors here, uh, you're, do we, is that really needed? If I want that's 1080p content, as good as I can get it, let's get the best cinematic 1080p projector. And there's also the cost factor involved. And that experience that a, for, that a, a, a cost-effective projector like our 45 or 65 ES can deliver. And again, it's about an experience. You know, if you've got an 85-inch TV, throw a sound bar on that, and you've got a very simple uh, system for 5,800 bucks. And that's big. It's somewhat immersive going to 85, but it's not nearly what you can do with, say, a 120-inch screen. You can do a 120-inch screen with an HD projector like our 45, a Dolby Atmos soundbar that gives you a pretty damn good uh, uh, sound performance and immersive surround capability uh, for uh, – and throw that in with an Apple TV or whatever your favorite streaming device is, 4800 bucks for a 120-inch screen. That 120-inch screen for $4,800 is going to be a 41% larger image over that 85. It's 17% less expensive. And, uh, you know, from an install and sales perspective, you're making a whole lot more on that at 40 points versus the, uh, versus the flat panel at a considerably lower margin there. So a uh, really exceptional uh, value proposition for your clients uh, looking at our, uh, our project HD projection with the right screen. Now we want to step up to real 4K. All right, let's do it. Uh, 295 ES, at four, uh, our second generation, uh, our second projector, I should say, but coming out below the $5,000 price point. This is the replacement for the very successful 285. Uh, this projector is, is simply spectacular for 4K content, 
true 4K HDR performance, a 1500 lumen uh, high output lamp on it uh, with 6,000 hours of, la of lamp life, uh, full IP control. All of our 4K projectors are using our X1 processor that gives them 4K reality creation, 4K motion flow, 4K anamorphic lens support, that super low game, uh, low lag time on for uh, the gaming mode, and your 18 gigabit per second HDMI inputs. Quick word on that uh, that low input uh, lag time. All of our projectors have discrete picture modes, and one of them is uh, that you can discreetly call up by IP, serial, or IR commands. One of those is the game mode. When you're using a projector with a uh, PlayStation, Xbox, whatever your favorite flavor of gaming system is, make sure you build that into your macro for the projector to select the, uh, the game input because we do have special processing in there that gives you really exceptional low input lag time uh, for gaming applications. And then when you go back to watching your streaming satellite, cable, Blu-ray, whatever else, make sure it switches back to Cinema One for properly calibrated video. Uh, Want to step up the 695 at $10,000, $99.99, uh, gives you 1800 lumens. So we're going better brightness. It gives you our dynamic iris. So with the dynamic iris, you're getting about a 40% peak improvement in contrast and black level over the 295. It also gives you the picture position lens memory for those multiple aspect ratio screens. So what do you get for going up to, uh, to the 695? You get better brightness, you get more contrast, and you get those multiple aspect ratios. So a couple of really clear steps as you move up to the, uh, to the 695. Next step beyond the 695 moves you up to the 885. This is where we get into lasers. Uh, this is a true 4K HDR Z phosphor laser with 2,000 lumens, 20,000 hour half-life. Uh, half-life in a laser-based projector, that's half of your original brightness. All light systems will slowly decay over time. Uh, at 20,000 hours, that's half of the original brightness of the projector. Uh, we figure that is the point where, yeah, okay, it comes time to replace it. Uh, so when it talk about replacing a laser projector, you know, really you're talking about a lifetime, uh, the, a light source that lasts the lifetime of the projector. 20,000 hours, what does that mean in real world applications? If we watch the projector five hours a day, 365 days a week, that comes out to, uh, to just under 11 years. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to take a projector much past that time frame. You ought to be selling the client a new projector. Hey, uh, 8K projectors will be out then, and we can get them into a, uh, that next step up. Uh, so with this, you also get, again, picture position for that lens memory, the X1 processor, 4K reality creation, 4K motion flow, anamorphic modes for 4K, that low input get lag mode. Uh, all of these features carry, carry throughout most of the lineup here. Uh, the 995 is our newest projector uh, that released at uh, CDIA, started shipping back in November. Uh, this guy is a stunner. It is the same form factor as the 885, but with that big massive arc F lens. Uh, the arc F lens is an 18 element, all glass, uh, uh, 15 different individual lens groups, 110 millimeter aluminum body. Uh, it is quite simply the most spectacular set of optics that has ever been in put into a projector, consumer or professional. Uh, this is, uh, this is world-class optics. If you've got a client who's into cameras, make sure you bring up this, uh, the, uh, this projector. You know, that's again, a great leading question. You know, trying to figure out, Hey, what's a client into? What is their expectation of performance? If you've got a client who's shooting with the Sony Alpha digital SLR, you start talking about the arc F lens, they're going to be a lock to go with a projector like the 995. Uh, it also has an optional short throw arc F lens. So if you need to get this really close to the, to the screen or do a rear projection application, the, uh, the short throw lens gives you a whole lot of flexibility. Uh, it's 10% brighter than an 885 with 2200 lumens. It has that same 20,000 hour half-life. Uh, it has a dynamic iris, so it gives you incredible black levels. Uh, this one actually uses what we call our dual contrast control engine where we combine the power of the dynamic iris along with the variable output of the laser to give you the best black level we've ever seen in a, uh, in a projector uh, at this level. Uh, you know, 4K reality creation, 4K motion flow, 4K anamorphic animal lens support, all of that good stuff goes into the, uh, the 995 as well. 
And then for the client who's got to have it all, the big, biggest, baddest boy on the block, the 5000 ES. This is a 5000 lumen class 3R liquid cooled laser. I'm here in Texas where that class 3R laser is one step below weapons grade. And this is some serious horsepower. Uh, it is a uh, it's that same Mark F lens that we get in the Vi in the 995, uh, but with a whole lot more power behind it. Uh, incredible black level, the best brightness, the best take capabilities you will see on any projector. This guy's been out for about three years now and is still the absolute king of projectors. I just saw another review on it uh, the other day where actually they reviewed the professional version of it, uh, which and like it's the professional version was uh, uh, $72,000 for the same configuration. So great, great value on buying the consumer version uh, but again they just continued to rave about how amazing this projector was over 300 nits of output uh, incredible uh, just cannot say enough great things about the performance of the 5000 ES so uh, you know the other projector in the lineup is really that uh, projector that does things that no projector should do and that's fit into rooms where projectors aren't made to operate, uh, the, to go right up uh, against the screen and give you the capability for a hundred, anywhere from an 80 to 120 inch image uh, with only uh, you know, maximum distance from the wall, about six inches. So really exceptional flexibility is 4K, it is laser, it is 2000 lumen, tw actually, excuse me, 2500 lumens of output, uh, really flexible projector with the VC1000. And, you know, and again, I know this was a big talk at uh, Cedia. There were lots of manufacturers trying to come out with something similar to this. But again, they were all 4K, they were all e shifties, they were all double flashies. Uh, there was nothing that was a true native 4K, true high brightness, true color range, full HDR performance, uh, and the capability that a projector like the VZ1000 has. Beautiful thing about the VZ1000 is go front projection, rear projection, uh, floor mount, ceiling mount. It can be built in. It is a uh, really flexible piece, and it is really impressive when you use it with the right screen material. Uh, EPV, their uh, Dark Star uh, UST Affinity screen material, is a ultra short throw material. It's designed to reject over 95% of your overhead light. That means you can have it in rooms with very bright, uh, you know, ambient light, uh, overhead light, side, uh, side light. You want to try and keep sheltered on any of these systems. They're designed primarily to reject overhead light, but uh, really gives you exceptional performance uh, because it only returns the light directly from that angle of the projector. Uh, these come in uh, you know, anywhere from 100 to 120 inches and can really give you some exceptional performance with this VC1000 projector in a very high ambient light room. Uh, the other option uh, that makes this really uh, attractive is its ability to be built in. Of course, you can design your own custom uh, custom furniture, uh, but we also uh, have a great partnership with Salamander where they, uh, they have a, a custom version of their cabinets that is made specifically to hold the VC1000 projector. Uh, so it'll go flush mounted into the cabinet, uh, really clean look, super easy to install, and uh, you know, put your screen up, you can be in and out on a day with a uh, with a full surround system, full custom cabinetry, and a uh, again just overall uh, beautiful installation. A couple of applic uh, things that you want to have, a couple of our tools, uh, pr figuring out where the projector needs to go. Uh, you need to figure out throw distance, offsets, vertical, horizontal, uh, all of your, your information to properly place the projector. Uh, you want to use our calculator. For the love of God, please do not use projectorcentral.com. Uh, love the guys over there, but they are about 90% accurate. And you don't want to be that one time where they are a little bit off on our measurements. I unfortunately get a call or two of that on that every month, and uh, they, uh, they just quite cannot get uh, our measurements exactly right. So, so please use our applications, our tools that we provide for you. Uh, for your, uh, for your uh, mobile device, Android or iOS, we've got a great application. It's very simply called Projection Simulator. Uh, search for that on your, uh, your app store, and you can uh, punch in your projector model screen, uh, screen size and aspect ratio, and it'll tell you where the projector can go. Uh, this is also located on our premium home website. 
SonyPremiumHome.com is a uh, exceptional website. It is built for you, the custom integrator. It is uh, everything at retail pricing, uh, you know, great comparison charts, um, you know, uh, detailed dimension drawings, PDFs of uh, not only our projectors, but our TVs, AVRs, other components as well. And on the uh, Premium Home website, there is a version of Projection Simulator as well, if you prefer to run this from your desktop. The other asset that you want to make sure that you have down is our eSupport website, uh, eSupport.sony.com. This is where you go to get go to get manuals. You go to get firmware updates. You go to get any um, you know pro, um, uh, documentation you need for our projectors, TVs, AVRs. Uh, uh, eSupport.sony.com. Also parts, uh, some, you know, any of those little accessories that you need that uh, can be uh, can be ordered here from eSupport. Um, all of our projectors uh, do occasionally get uh, get firmware updates. Uh, the, we do not do the firmware updates online. Uh, these are uh, done only by USB. They're designed to be done by you, the integrator, not necessarily by the client. Uh, so, uh, like the 5000 ES just had a uh, an upgrade come out that uh, added some new uh, capabilities to it. Uh, we've uh, we've addressed a couple of issues. Like there was a weird weird deal where Apple was uh, and their Apple TV was doing some uh, some weird metadata. Okay, we fixed we uh, we made out came out with a correction for that since they're of course they're doing something wrong we have to fix it uh, but we wanted to make sure that these things always perform right uh, the updates are downloaded and uh, onto a USB from the uh, eSupport website and then loaded into the projector great thing about them is hey if it's not broke don't fix it you don't have to do these firmware updates uh, but uh, when we do come out with them they are either to fix a specific problem or add a specific a new capability to one of our projectors so uh, keep this in mind and make sure that uh, uh, you know, if you're out there doing a service call, you might want to make sure the projector is fully up to date. And then finally, my contact info. If you have any questions on system design, installation, you know, hey, where, how, how, where can I put this projector? I'm doing a, a room. Can I fit, fit it here? Can I do this? I would much rather tell you yes or no on the design stage than have to wait until you're on a 20-foot ladder trying to hit something that a projector is not going to hit. Uh, so any design questions, please give me a call. Happy to help you out. We also have demos available. Uh, if you have a client who's in the, the market for that short throw projector, Projector or one of the big laser projectors, and they're like, man, I, 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 I hear everything you're telling me about it, but I've got to see a $50,000, $60,000 projector before I drop that kind of money on it. Uh, get in touch with your sales rep there at AllNet, and uh, they'll work with me. I've got demos of all of these units. Uh, we can get shipped out to you uh, to, uh, to do a proper demo. You're in the field. You've got a, pro a projector, and this also goes for all of our ES and XBR components. You've got a projector that's giving you a trouble light. You've got a T TV, you've got an AVR, any of our components, they're not performing right for you in the field, call our ES support line, 866-924-7669. Uh, these are our CDS certified guys. They know their uh, know their products. They know their installations. They're going to be able to help you out in the field, advanced replacement service, whatever needs to be done to, uh, to get your client taken care of. Uh, they're your go-to contact in the field for that immediate technical support. Uh, so with that, that's everything that I've got. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Yeah, we do. We do have a couple of questions that came through. Um, so, if you want to, can you go back to uh, the 685 and the 885 or the 895? So, the question that came through is, um, so there's another vendor that during a training on laser uh, talked about modulating light output with the by the laser, like the the. the Laser is uh, more agile than a lamp. Obviously, a lamp you can't really dim it 60 times a second like you can with, uh, you know, other another technology. So you were saying earlier that we do that with the dynamic iris. Now I notice on your slides for the laser that we have a dynamic iris. So were we doing kind of both to uh, modulate that brightness? 
That is correct. So um, in the a, a laser does have you know completely variable output, so it can go full brightness, it can go zero output, output, and it can do uh, anything in between almost instantaneously. Uh, and I just realized actually I do have a typo here on the 885. The 885 does not have the dynamic iris. It it controls its black level uh, simply by uh, controlling that laser light output. Uh, so there, um, when you go, that's one of the steps up advantages of the 995 uh -huh. is the 955 combines an iris with that laser control. Uh, so what that benefit allows us to do is like when we need a dark scene, but really high bright highlights, we can run that, uh, that uh, laser at really high brightness, but then use the iris to clamp down. So we get that combination of best peak brightness and best bright uh, black level simultaneously. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that definitely clarifies the question. Okay. Um, going back to um, HDR mapping, is that does that require a Dolby Vision source? No, it does not. Uh, so there is no such thing as Dolby Vision in projectors. We get that uh, that question oh. all the time. And the uh, yeah. the reason being is uh, Dolby has not created a profile uh, for uh, for home cinema projection. Uh, they're just barely getting into doing Dolby Cinema for professional. Uh, they have not gotten into the home cinema projection yet. So this is using all HDR10 content um, uh, or hybrid log gamma content. So any of your HDR Blu-rays, any of your HDR content, on Netflix or your streaming sources and any of your HDR content from DirecTV or any of your broadcast providers is fully compatible with our projectors. Okay, perfect. Dolby Vision is not required. Okay. Um, another follow-up clarification question on laser versus dynamic iris or laser plus dynamic iris in the case of the 995. Um, and this, I think, is just a kind of general question. I don't know that we're going to be able to act on this. Um, when it's sensing, now it's it's doing this off of APL information, right, or average picture level information. Uh, yeah, the projector is reading the uh, the incoming signal frame by frame and making these adjustments in real time based upon the uh, uh, the metadata of the scene. Okay, so the question that comes through is: Is this a is this something that where there's tagging or metadata in the, from the source, or is this something that Sony is doing through the processor, like the processor's measuring it? and then applying the correct information out to either the iris or the laser or both. I, this is actually all processing right here. So the uh, like okay. with HDR content, uh, it's a fixed set of metadata for the uh, for the projector or the or flat panel, uh, and it says, "Hey, here I'm sending you HDR content. Here's my peak brightness. Here's my peak black level. You do with it what you do." But then we go through and we're uh, creating our own dynamic metadata again on a frame by frame basis to uh, to make sure the iris uh, uh, you know is adjusted properly, our reality creation and everything is all adjusted properly. So that's all okay. in the Sony processing. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, and I think from my experience back in the day, we used to, um, the sister company to all that, to be the representative for Perugia, and, and Perugia, their claim to fame was our processing is so good that we disregard all the tags because the tags are always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So we measure everything, and we uh, act on our process. Our, our processing acts on our measurements uh, of the incoming signal, and not necessarily on the flags, because the flags are always wrong. Yeah, I, I love um, that line. That was I can't Gordon, completely. By the way. I know you know who Gordon is. Absolutely can't can't completely disagree with that, but uh, um, you know. We, we do have an advantage since we're the ones making most of the content. Uh, oh, sure. we, we, we own the, uh, uh, the compression algorithms. We've, de we've developed most of this. We don't have to throw it all away, but, uh, but certainly we are doing a lot of that content creation, a lot of that metadata creation on our own. Okay. Uh, another question that came through is in regard to your flat panel sessions that you did with us uh, live in person in the market. Um, you shared uh, some of your personal resources that you've collected, and and some of them I see on your uh, slide deck here, uh, the HDR uh, information where we show uh, this, how Sony outperforms some competing units. Do you have a list of these scenes and where they're at in these films uh, for 
people who have showrooms where maybe they want to, you know, throw up a $1,200 DLP or something like that just to show that, you know, uh, it's not all about lumens and pixels. It's also about, you know, the technology behind it and the processing. Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't have anything uh, all written down. I know a lot of uh, different scenes and content. Maybe I should put some together like that. I'll, uh, luckily, uh, I'm not on the road here for uh, for a couple more weeks, so uh, uh, I'll I'll see if I can put together a document for that. I'll uh, get over to you, Rick, so you can get it distributed. Sure, I so. can share it with everyone on the call today. So yeah. the ones, the two that you showed, I really liked those. The, um, the ones with the uh, the fire and then the three. Uh, the three lights, how it turns into one giant bloom on the DLP mm -hmm. product. So, yeah, yeah these two are two from King, uh, those in yeah, this one's from Kingsman. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure the exact chapter and scene on that one. And then uh, this one, I think, is from chapter 13 in, uh, in Oblivion. So, uh, yeah, these okay. are both uh, consumer available content, but I'll, uh, I'll get you the details on these and uh, see if, and a couple others that we like to use on a regular basis. Okay, I'm going to go by, we've got, I'm in the Troy, Michigan branch, and we still have our 1000 ES KUHD player, so I'm going to see if we can uh, petty cash these uh, titles to get these in the building today, because we've got, I think we still have a 385 up for a projector. Okay. So, you know, we've got a, a projector demo here in the in the office. So, all right. Um, I think that's, that's it for the questions. Oh, um, can you put back the, uh, the slide that shows uh, the projection app? Oh, of course. There you go. Projection oh, there simulator. Go. Okay. And it's when you searchable search... under iOS store or Android store is just projection, Sony projection simulator? No, no, so it's just projection simulator. It's by oh, Sony. Nice. But for some reason, um, at least on the Android side, I don't know about Apple, but if you search Sony projection simulator, it won't pop up. If you just simply search projection uh -huh. simulator and in the description and comments will say by Sony, uh, that is where you will find the app. Okay, perfect. All right. And uh, what is availability, or is, are you comfortable discussing availability on the uh, 995? Uh, yeah, all uh, projectors are uh, currently available. I don't think we've got any big back orders on anything. So, uh, uh, yeah, last uh, last update is uh, most everything, uh, or uh, not most everything is uh, is readily available. So, uh, uh, yeah, the 995, I think we just got caught up on. So we're we're in good shape. Okay. So yeah, I think. Uh, that might have been one of the last updates is that we were still waiting on some 995s. So it's good to hear that those are caught up. Okay. I think we're, I think we're good. Let me double check the questions you have. Um, oh, no, we definitely have more here. Okay. Um, we're having some blue screen handshake issues on a 995. We're using a 1000 ES uh, UHD Blu-ray. A uh, Krell Foundation processor for the switching, and then straight shot out to the projector, maybe 60 or 65 feet away using high quality HDMI cable. It uses, works 90% of the time, but it goes to blue screen for the first three or four turn on tries and we power cycle to get the handshakes back up. Um, one of the considerations, he's like, we're maybe considering going with one of the new 4K 18 gig extender kits. Uh, do you have any recommendations for extender kits? Uh, my personal favorite so far has been optical. Uh, if you're going, if you look at the HDMI spec, 18 gig, uh, 4K HDR, uh, the most you can do on a unassisted is about 25 feet, uh, you know, 7.5 meters. Uh, anything over that, you've got to have active, uh, and this is where, unfortunately, any active. Uh, any Balin solution could cause uh, cause some handshake issues because you're having to negotiate more edids and information back and forth. So um, optical has been one of my personal preferences, but uh, there's a number of, of other good uh, 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 good quality products out there that will. Uh, but you want to make sure that if anytime you're using
using an active product that it has the ability to manage the EDID. If you uh, if you have EDID learning capability, EDID management capability in your uh, cable or your uh, your Balin system, uh, you are going to get much more reliable handshakes. Okay. So, so there's a variety I'll, of manufacturers that do that. I'll offer this up. So uh, I know the, the person asking the question is there are Illinois location so brad work with uh work with your contact in elk grove so we've got extender kits that are uh 18 gig friendly from uh binary our house brand with snap av and also from av pro and also from atlona so one of those three is going to hit your comfort level and your budget and also um what andrew was just talking about the optical cables we've got optical cables from three vendors as well and those are uh ultra reliable um one brand or two brands use the uh, USB pigtails for power, and the other brand uses the five volt bus off the HDMI feed. So again, whatever you're more comfortable with, um, they can help you with the price points and all that. And maybe you can get you a, a sample piece if you want to play with it, since you're already having an issue on an existing install. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, just just for reference, we use AV Pro Connect for all of our uh, our our displays. Uh, anytime we're doing any of the shows or anything, we're using AV Pro Connect. Uh, really great stuff. So, uh, but uh, like I said, I, also if you're when you're in the field, you're doing this testing, uh, feel free to give the guys at ES Tech Support a call uh, at that eight six six nine two four number. Uh, they're going to be able to help you out within field troubleshooting and, and anything else we can do to get that going on site. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we've had really good luck with AV Pro um, as well. We've got really good partners in this space for all three of our uh, primary partners. Uh, let me see. So Matt is asking for, uh, since you <laughs> openly, I don't want to say disparage, but you certainly threw out a caution to acoustically transparent screens. Um, Matt asks if you have any uh, screen recommendations for um, uh, 235 aspect ratio screen acoustically transparent with a 695 projector. Um, be be forewarned that any acoustically tra uh, again this is where I, the the hi-fi guy and the video guy in me gets uh, gets conflicted uh, for proper placement. Yes, the speaker should be behind the screen, but uh, it hurts your video because most acoustically transparent screens do lose you know anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the light output. Uh, my personal preference for uh, you know or my recommendation I should say for the acoustically transparent screen is the right one for the room. Uh, there are still different screens materials and stuff that are out there um, you know I've seen you know really good good results with uh, you know some some materials in in certain applications that don't work well in others so really you want to work with your screen vendor figure out what's right for the room for the light out for the the audio system the colors the ambient light all of that for your room uh, there's a lot of great ones out there uh, so you know, definitely work with your screen vendors and and get the, the material that's right for the room is the uh, is the is the best material to use. Okay, and Matt's local to us here, so he's yeah. the one posing the question. Matt, if you'd like, right. I've got samples here in the building for the two. We've got two uh, AT screens that we uh, can supply. So if you'd like, you can come by and uh, take a look at the sample. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to take it out and you know, throw it on the wall in front of uh, in front of projector on the site, you're welcome. To with you if you'd like. Okay, so Len is asking, do all the 4K models now include a vertical stretch mode for use with a lens while in native 4K resolution? Past models, Absolutely. vertical stretch works in 1080 signal, but not 4K signal. Correct. That is an improvement with the new models is now every project 4K projector in the lineup supports 4K vertical stretch. Okay, so that's anything ending in, in 9.5? Correct. Okay, perfect. All right. Bear with me for a moment. I'm trying to stretch out these windows so that I can read these things here. All right. Um, Matt asked a follow-up question on screen materials. Uh, other, other considerations for screen pairings, uh, material and gain, and is constant image height the only mode supported for picture memory? Um, no, not necessarily. Picture memory can be anything you want it to be. So, um, you know, because it's just what it's doing with picture memory is it's memorying a zoom shift and focus application. So, you know, 
one other common thing that I do with uh, uh, picture position in a showroom is I will set up a, uh, a picture position memory of a 75 inch screen. You, uh, you know, zoom the projector down to 75 inches in your showroom and then have it zoom back out to that 120, 150, whatever size you're, you're showing. And that's a great visual representation for a client, uh, you know, when showing them, hey, is a 75 big hit a picture, uh, uh, you know, memory position on the projector, have it scan down to 75 inches and then have it blow back up to that 120 or whatever the size of your demo screen is. And that gives a client a really clear visual example of you now this this is a much more impactful image at 75 85 whatever just is not big enough um but i've uh i've also seen picture position used with uh, screens like the director you know you know if you want to go all out and uh you know do a director probably the best screen i've ever seen is the stewart director's choice uh of course it's it's a any aspect ratio it's fifty thousand dollars uh or so give or take on your size and uh absolutely picture position can be used with that to do any aspect ratio uh with a uh, screen like the director's choice nice okay um one follow-up question from matt on screen uh do you your preference, woven or perf? What are the trade-offs between woven and perf? Uh, woven versus perf. Uh, yes. uh, woven. This could be this could be its own webinar. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, in general, um, woven is typically going to be a little bit better audio quality, but because of the uh, the surface not being as smooth as a perf, it can create some difficulties in focus and and fine detail um, that would be my in a nutshell answer I could you know, like I said they, it could be its own webinar but um, you know that's I would typically say woven again a little better audio perf a little bit better on the video side so go well, let me ask go you, with what's let me more ask important. A question so one of the drawbacks of perf always used to be more a if the mm -hmm. If the chipset happened to line up with the perf pattern, is that still a thing, or have they kind of gotten it perfected with the the angle of the perf pattern, and and obviously with the new uh, chipsets being much higher in resolution? That is, is extreme, thing? extremely rare to see. Um, I've okay. I haven't heard of anybody yet mention problems with more A on a perf screen, and she's uh, ages. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, I just remember that was one of the old school uh, conversations. Was why. Uh, everyone was kind of leaning toward uh, Woven when Woven kind of came to market about whatever it was, 15 years ago or so. Okay. Um, another question that came up, this, this is from our our top integrator friend, Ken, He our uh, calibrator friend, Ken. He asks, the firmware for the new 5000, will it include the dynamic iris control on the 5000ES? Uh, not at this point in time. Uh, we are still researching that. Uh, and if uh, that's the 5,000, the, the, the engineers are looking at it doesn't really need the uh, uh, the dynamic iris because it's got so much control over the laser and its extreme brightness range. Um, and I don't know if it would be a hardware or just firmware update to do that. So uh, that's still uh, under uh, evaluation. Okay. But th correct me if I'm wrong, that model has iris control for the um, uh, for the setup, right? To set like the maximum brightness for the room? The, the 5000? Uh, no, yeah. it does not. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Ken said, uh, review your 5000 slide because 5000 slide is apparently slightly misleading. Okay. Oops. Okay. Sorry about uh, that. Uh, no worries. Mike asks about, um, can you talk? Talk a little bit about how the system does up conversion for non 4K sources, uh, both in um, the resolution and also from SDR to HDR content. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. So we do. Uh, or does it, know, hold on. Well, I guess the follow up question is that is um, unlike a flat panel, does a does a projector can a projector just reproduce standard HDR or a standard SDR in SDR, or does it always up convert to HDR? Okay, so yeah, a couple of a couple of parts to that question. So H, uh, you know, anything up to uh, you know. 
below 4K is going to be up converted to 4K. Again, this is using Sony processing that's been perfected over many years. Uh, you know, things like our reality creation, our understanding of what the content is, what met, what uh, the the frame rates, the dynamic range capability, the uh, uh, what uh, compression algorithm was used. This is our process that uh, that gives you the uh, that really clean up conversion, and it's really good leveraging all of our technologies. Um, we do not do in a projector any HD, uh, SDR to HDR up conversion. Uh, the, I, uh, in a projector world, I typically tend to not recommend doing that level of up conversion. Uh, there are some device streaming devices like an Apple TV that will up convert any of your uh, HDR content uh, or any of your SDR content to HDR. Uh, personally, uh, from a pure and from a purist perspective, I don't like to see that. Uh, nope, a 1975 episode of Saturday Night Live streaming through uh, uh, Hulu was never meant to be seen in HDR, nor was a lot of the content that's out there. So, uh, uh, doing that level of up conversion, I don't think is really uh, as beneficial in a projector. In a flat panel where you have the brightness and dynamic range capability. There's still there's a little bit more flexibility, but uh, again, even that personally, I, I like to turn a lot of that stuff off uh, and see the uh, the content as was natively produced. But if you uh, yeah, so if you want to do HDR to SDR up conversion, you know, again, third party device like an Apple TV will do that. Okay, all right. Um, the next question that came through. Um, a laser-based or laser light engine DLP projector. There's a, another unit out on the market, uh, around twelve thousand dollars, around six thousand lumens. Um, even though it has a, a high light output, and obviously the the benefits of the laser are attractive to him and to the client. Any thoughts on uh, selling the uh, the comparable Sony laser unit with the SXRD panel. Okay, sure. Uh, so a a single chip DLP. Uh, the you'll if you dig into the specs, you'll see white brightness versus color brightness. Those two numbers are oftentimes very different. Uh, that uh, you know on a uh, on a DLP based projector, as these these devices are using the single chip with the color wheel. Uh, the color wheel is going to decrease your brightness uh, depending upon how many segments and how the se those segments are configured in the uh, the DLP projector. Uh, you've also got got a uh, you know potential for rainbow and some of the other artifacts that come through a uh, uh, through a uh, color wheel with an SXRD projector, you you've got three discrete chips: red, green, and blue. So you're producing all of your color all at the same time. We don't have to double flash the DLPs. We don't have to, uh, you know, flash multiple colors. We can produce all the color, and you're getting so. And ultimately, that's going to give you a wider color range. And while I have not, I'm, I've not compared that particular unit, but we've compared a lot of the uh, uh, the three to four thousand lumen uh, uh, DLP projectors that are on the market currently uh, to the 295 series and the 295 is noticeably brighter uh, at less than half of the bright uh, rated brightness versus any other DLP unit I put it up against okay all right and yeah your comment about um, the visible artifacts so remember again this goes back to the years when this was a more common conversation but the idea of rainbows and, and, and you know probably was like a, a third of the population just sees rainbows so I've been a big fan of the Elgos models your yours and the other you know, as you call them the other Japanese vendor um, for years because no one sees any anomalies. It's a three chip product and it's just absolutely fantastic. And you don't have to have that uncomfortable conversation when, you know, uh, grandma can't sit in the projector room or whatever. <laughs> okay. um, absolutely. Let me see. Um, oh, can you put the slide up that shows the uh, support site resources, uh, the ES tech line and the Sony premium home. Okay. So 
So we've got Sony Premium Home is uh, www.sonypremiumhome.com. Then we have eSupport, eSupport.sony.com. No www on that one. Okay. And then, then my contact info and uh, ES Tech Support. Okay. So we've kind of got a question here. So like the does ARC have any use at all in projection setups? Hmm. ARC, I'm not following you here. Um, audio return channel? Oh, audio return channel. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I was like, ARC. Yeah. ARC, sorry. ARC F lens. <laughs> okay, audio return <laughs> channel. Uh, no, um, audio return channel would not be used in uh, any of the projector applications simply because we're not, you know, you know, I get it, get it all the time about our, you know, TVs. It's like, why can't Sony just build a monitor only? I, all I want my display to do is just create a picture. Great, we got to buy a projector. Um, you know, projectors are video only devices, no audio support at all. Uh, so ARC and all that goes uh, completely out the window. Okay. All right. So if uh, something like the um, the Roku stick or fire stick something like that put it on your switch yeah you'd want that or say just, or yeah. just use the standalone box instead of the, instead of the stick correct yeah so use that plug directly into a sound bar into your uh into your avr whatever whatever yeah. audio source you're using for that that zone and uh, just a side note here i happen to for the first time ever, use a Roku stick on a receiver last night at my own house. <laughs> and uh, it's the reason why is because I've got an older panel and I don't have audio return. And I didn't want to pull a, a Toslink back. So I went ahead and uh, just put the Roku I took a Roku stick home and I just plugged it in the back. I've got a Marantz receiver. I plugged it in the back of the Marantz receiver and I got it to work. And so I, I didn't even know you could put the stick right in the back of your switch. I figured, well, it's HDMI, maybe it'll work, and sure enough, it did. So, I guess if that's what you've got, it does work. I've tested it last night. Right. Uh, um, oh, and side note on that, eARC, enhanced yeah. audio return channel, is now active on all of our AVRs, and it's uh, active in our Master Series TVs. Uh, so I can use the internal app net. I can use the internal Netflix app on the TV. I can use any sources plug directly into the TV and I get Dolby Atmos back to my AVR over arc. So that's pretty cool. That's uh, uh, new on our TVs. Just uh, um, just went active here a few weeks ago. So again, not on the project. The world, unfortunately, but, the arc. Right. The enhanced arc. E -arc. Oh, nice. OK, cool. Uh, Troy's asking, can we get a copy of the presentation? Yeah, Troy, we can share the content with you, and also we will have this recorded, and it'll be published on our uh, YouTube channel and uh, probably within the week, within a week before, ne before next week's session. Okay. Oh, IMAX Enhanced, did you touch on this? Um, are any of these products IMAX Enhanced, or is it strictly a Master Series uh, flat panel? <sighs> All right, shame on me. I did not mention IMAX enhanced. Oh, yes, dear. all of all of our 4K projectors are IMAX enhanced uh, certified. So uh, that's uh, that's ready to rock and roll right out of the box uh, for uh, for IMAX enhanced capability. Uh, okay. Many of our flat panels are, and the IMAX enhanced update on AVR just went live yesterday. I upgraded my 5000 ES to IMAX enhanced this morning, and it's uh, it's now uh, now fully up to speed. Oh, no kidding! Nice. All right, so uh, now you mentioned the um, firmware update on the receivers, and I think you and I spoke offline about firmware updating previous Master Series flat panels. Are the 8.5 series and the older 4Ks going to be um, uh, upgradable, or is it strictly for the 9.5 series and forward? Uh, the 2.8.5, 3.8.5 are IMAX enhanced um, already. They, uh, they were... Uh, they were already meeting and exceeding the capabilities necessary for uh, for IMAX enhanced. Um, I'd have to double check on the 675 or uh, the 675 is. I'd have to check on earlier models, uh, but uh, I don't think they are. If it did not have HDR capability, it's, it it definitely cannot go enhanced. And 
Um, so the, the older 600s, 1100s, uh, so on will not get the enhanced update, but the, uh, uh, the 285, 385, 675 uh, are already re are all set and ready to go. They, they are fully IMAX certified as is. Nice. Okay. That adds a lot of value. Um, like you said, the 285, we have tons of them out in the field. Okay. All right. All right. So, again, Troy's going to ask a question. He's going to throw it right out there. Um, another another vendor is doing e shift to their new 4K native and calling it an 8K e shift. Now, when we had you in for the uh, flat panel, we were talking about the, how the inputs aren't necessarily 2.1 level inputs. I mean, you had kind of a competitive analysis of our product Correct. versus their or your product versus their product. You want to share some of those details? Uh, uh, yeah, well, that competitor's product uh, does not have the ability to accept uh, any 8K source. Not that there's any 8K source currently available, uh, but it does not have the ability to accept 8K, uh, so it will not be able to to display any any 8K content there. Uh, their 8K uh, e shift is simply processing. Uh, and simulated 8K. Um, so, uh, you know, 8K in projection world, uh, you know, again, a whole other webinar we could do on this, but the uh, uh, native 8K per, in a projection world, I do not know when we're going to see that. Uh, it's, uh, there's there's nothing in the, uh, the foreseeable product line that uh, will give us native 8K in a projection. Do we have 8K in the uh, the cinema units that are going out to the, the you know the AMC's of the world? Or are they still uh, they're still using the 4K chipsets, right? In those in those big units? Yes, they're still using the 4K chipsets, and they are they have the ability to do uh, to do 8K uh, in a cinema environment. When you look at the uh, the uh, the double stack that we have right here. Uh, we actually can do 8K in a cinema environment, but it requires a dual projection system like you see on this slide. Uh, that's about a half million dollar setup right now. So, um, you know, is it is it possible uh, with existing technology? Yes, we're talking multiple light engines, though, to do it, to produce, to actually produce more pixels and native pixels. We have to have multiple light engines. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, so the IMAX question begs this next question. Uh, what about THX certification for projectors? Is that important? Uh, that, that has to do with, you know, there's a competitor that, that touts that they've got THX certification on there. Correct. Um, THX certification is in the projection world is a, uh, is a series of standards uh, saying that it does this, it does that. It does not necessarily mean that there's any difference to the, uh, uh, to the content or the, the projector is going into a, uh, a special t the, the THX mode that's on there is is simply their their color calibrated mode uh, with IMAX enhanced there is actually IMAX enhanced content that will be coming and the projectors will be able to recognize uh, the metadata in that content and perform appropriately uh, so uh, you know it's when you break it down uh, you know kind of get into it THX and IMAX uh, enhanced are in some regards, competitors uh, to uh, to each other, but IMAX is going a bit further because they are actually producing uh, the the content and you know having it spe specifically made for the home environment. Okay, so in the THX, really the badge on there is kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval, where you have to pay for it and it just meets a certain level of of uh, performance that's still Correct. That's, and, and that's been their thing since pretty much since the beginning right i think that's a big reason why you've seen a lot of manufacturers you know put a, put less and less emphasis on the uh, the thx branding okay well all right oh hey kudos uh troy says good info thank you and uh, thanks for the awesome response to the question on imax enhanced so definitely i think we're adding some value there all righty here let me see All right. Specific on the 
NKE shift versus uh, uh, units. So they are claiming their contrast is the best. Their contrast figures show to be the best. Do you have any insight on uh, real versus claimed contrast and basically doing uh, shootouts on specs versus shootouts with two projectors? Uh, when they start shipping those projectors, we'll be able to tell you. Um, as of right now, last information I had is they are still not shipping. Uh, so uh, we haven't been able to get one in the barn yet to do some uh, do some comparison. But uh, that's something we, we look forward to doing uh, once those uh, those projectors are actually available on the marketplace. Okay, perfect. All right, looking through to make one more review of all the questions to make sure we got everything. You know, I don't want to disparage JVC. You know, obviously, um, all net, they're a good partner to Allnet as well, and they're a, no, I mean, a, a and, good and I, Absolutely, and I honestly, I mean, JVC is a very good product. I, I have nothing bad to say about them, but I think that we do something. Uh, I think we do some things better, and when you look at the overall value and performance, uh, you know, combination of what we provide, I, th I think that's that's where where we really come ahead. So, uh, but like I said, we'll 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 be doing some uh, some real world evaluations with them uh, when those units are available, so we can uh, you know maybe deliver more of that uh, more of those comparisons, and we'll be doing some shootouts and stuff at CD, I'm sure, again here this year. So. Nice. Yeah, the one thing I'll say about Sony is that you guys are not afraid to uh, step up and just do the Pepsi challenge. Absolutely. All right. Something else just popped up, but I don't know where it did. Okay. Mike says, thank you. Awesome as usual. Andrew, you're one of our favorites because everyone loves – Everyone loves your presentations. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Josh replies, can't find any firmware update on the support for the eARC. The last update I see is 4.506. Josh, or I'm sorry, John, can you reply? Are you talking about the ES receivers or are you talking about flat panels or which model are you talking about for the uh, that firmware support number? And, and is that. So Andrew, is that support or is that uh, for more update that you have? Is that a um, is that a beta thing they sent out to you, or is that rolled out and available to all everyone? Uh, nope, it's available for everyone. Uh, what what product are we talking about? I'm waiting for him to okay. Because the post, uh, uh, now for TVs, it is only on the uh, currently on the Master Series, so that's going to be Z Z9F and A9F AVRs. It's the uh, um, 810, 1100, 2131, uh, 5000 already rocks it with uh, uh, ER capability. Okay. So the the ER is not available on the like the A1E and the the previous. Correct. Yeah. As, what would uh, call it master series like the Z90s and the A1Es. Correct. A1E. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, ER is part of the uh, the HDMI 2.1 capabilities oh, okay. uh so uh you know unfortunately those those capabilities were only available uh at the time that the uh um, master series was released i do not don't take uh think this is uh everything but uh everything that i've I, d I don't anticipate um other models being able to get this updated they may surprise us and have it but uh as of okay. right now i do not believe other models will be updated Okay. That's just simply a hardware limitation. All right. Mike is asking again because you do such a good job of this when you come through our uh, our locations and you talk about all of your resources that you make available on the drive, shared drive. Um, do you have recommendations for demo content for IMAX Enhanced, 4K Atmos, etc.? Uh, IMAX enhanced, not yet. Uh, we're they're still getting the uh, the content out to us. Uh, 
Oh, gosh. Um, for Atmos and all the others, man, there's so many good ones out there. Um, I don't really have a consolidated list. Uh, maybe uh, that's something that, yeah, again, I need to need to work on. But uh, I tell you, I love love going to Blue, uh, Blu-ray.com. It uh, has um, some great list of best demo sequences and uh, the reviews and everything on the disc that are out there. So that's a, that's a reference I use on a, on a regular basis. Okay, I got an update from John, and then also Paul had asked a question as well. It sounds like they're both users of a 5000 ES projector, and they're asking about the firmware, uh, the latest firmware update in the 5000 ES model. Okay. So and Paul is asking specifically about uh, firmware updates for uh, 5000 ES. So it sounds like they're both asking about that firmware update that you, you know, we were talking about with Ken earlier. Yep. So, uh, yeah, firmware update on the 5000. I know there's a big one in the uh, in the works, and actually, I'm not sure if it's launched uh, yet here. But uh, let me see if I can pull something up on it here. And maybe that's one we can again we can take offline here. That uh, you know, okay. if we got any any other questions on that one, but uh, I know there is a big firmware update uh, in the works for the uh, for the 5000. Okay, and that was uh, my mistake when he asked about it. He said firmware update on e support, and I misread that as e arc support. So obviously it would just be uh, okay, e gotcha. support, meaning the to the place to check the firmware updates. So my, my apologies, John. I misread your question initially. Okay. Yeah, because the uh, the last uh, update there was the right. uh, uh, yeah on uh, eleven eight of la uh, seventeen. So uh, yeah, we are we are still waiting on the big firmware update for this uh, this guy that's going to address a number of uh, of picture quality and enhancements, operational improvements. Uh, so there's there's quite a few things coming in this uh, uh, firmware update. It's we we expect it to be due here sometime this quarter. Okay, so I'm writing myself a note here to follow up. So Paul, John, and Ken, I will follow up with Andrew, and we will get you information on the, the timing for that 5000 ES uh, firmware update as soon as we've got it. All right, and it looks like we don't have any other questions. Here, I thought we were done 20 minutes ago, Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> we, we had really good engagement on this session. That's always a good thing. All right, that's great. I appreciate everybody's uh, participation and uh, joining us for the uh, for the call. All right, and let me just do one more quick cursory review to make sure I have everything. Thanks a ton. Thanks a ton. Okay, everyone, thanks for the kind words. It's really appreciated. Um, all right, we we had we got to every question, Andrew. So, Wonderful. Andrew, I want to thank you for your time and everyone on the call. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, next week, we're going to have uh, our partners at Logitech are going to be on talking about advanced applications for the the Harmony platform, including Sonos integration, Nest integration, etc. So, it should be a good session with our buddy Brett. So. This session, we're going to go ahead and conclude this. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join us today. We will have this session posted in a, uh, less than a week. So thank you again.